Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Investing with IBD for January 29th, 2020. I'm your host, Arusha Pierce, and with me today is Scott Redler, Chief Strategic Officer of T3 Live. Thanks for being here, Scott. Thanks for having me. On today's podcast, we are going to talk about the current markets, the importance of moving averages, and then we will end the episode with three current stocks. Okay, so let's get into the current market. The market's in an uptrend. We have two distribution days on the NASDAQ and four on the S&P 500. Monday was definitely an interesting day with, with the, the sell-offs. But yeah, after a couple of days, the leading stocks have rebounded. Scott, what are your thoughts on the market so far? Well, we've been in a very strong, what I call a new active sequence since mid-October. If you remember, I believe on October 11th, the S&P had a, a gap up above like 29.60. And that was like the catalyst, which you might call a follow through in your big picture right. to a, a new current bull market, which for me as a prop trader, that's when I like to go into what I call portfolio approach, which I tend to take 10, 15, 20, the strongest names out there. So we've had two kind of shake the tree situations where, you know, we broke the A in 21 day, but then, you know, came back fast. One was in the beginning of December, and then one really was Friday to Monday. So, you know, on Friday, um, we opened up above whatever that high was, like 3320-ish. Yeah. Went back below it. We took out a prior day's low. So in technical analysis land, what do we call that? An outside type day. Right. So I also call that a day to take notice. So what I do is I reduce the number of positions and the number of shares I have in my portfolio approach just to be a bit more flexible. Yeah. You know, the S&P was up 28 plus percent last year. You know, we had our January. So a lot of the new flows come in from institutions and mutual funds. So for me, I was kind of looking for a reason to take some risk down mm -hmm. um, just in case. So I did take a lot of risk down. I went from my 20 plus positions to maybe eight or nine. And then on Monday morning, we had what I called the reactionary low. You know, we did a little bit of market discovery. The Dow had its worst day, you know, <laughs> since October, which is not the same as it used to be. Yeah. Um, I do think we put a low in somewhere around, what was it, 32, 30 ish. I don't have my charts in front of me. So about 100 handles off the high. Okay. So, um, you know, we did fill that gap from Monday yesterday. Yes. Which does negate some of the power of the bears. If the bears were that strong, in my humble opinion, we would not have been able to fill Monday's gap. So I think we're a little bit more in wait and see land where the market needs to prove that it could hold above Monday's low. We want to see how stocks react to earnings that have been coming in, which we'll get to. And um, I'm still actively long, but I'm a little bit more on, on lookout. I'm a little bit, you know, you know, one foot in the door, one foot out the door, you know, waiting to be either more tactical or stay with some current positions, but maybe, you know, a little bit more flexible with some hedges. Yeah. And, and, and you, you said one of the key words, we are in earnings season right now. And so you definitely want to make sure uh, you are aware of when your stocks are reporting earnings. How do you generally handle earnings season? Well, one of my rules is I never take stocks into earnings. Okay. I just don't do it. I've been trading for, I think, what, 22 years now. And, and if you take stock into earnings, you're guessing. More often than not, you're going to be wrong. You're going to blow up, whether you think it's a short, whether you think it's a long, unless you're a long-term investor, which is right. great. Okay, right. And you've held Apple for three years or you know Tesla for a bunch of years or whatever. But if you're a proprietary trader trading for P&L and cash flow, which is what I do for a living, you don't take stock into earnings. So what I do is I come up with option strategies. So if I want to be involved, just in case uh, there's a move that happens after hours that I might not be able to catch after hours, but I think can happen, um, I will take either calls, I'll take a call spread, I'll take puts or a put spread, or I'll wait for the earnings to actually happen. I'll identify uh, a pivot that if it gets above after hours and if it does it in a way I could trade it, I'll trade it after hours besides my options. But I will never all of a sudden say, hey, I'm taking the stock into earnings. I'm going home. I'm going to walk the dog, hang out with my family yeah. and see where it is the next day in the morning. OK, even even if you're up like 30 percent, they're pre going into earnings. You're you, you want to lock in those gains and say, you know, what? let's wait for that earnings reaction. And then I can come up with another strategy to get back in it. Yes, just because I'm a professional trader. I'm not a hedge fund. I'm not yeah. a mutual fund. I'm not talking about long-term accounts. I'm saying if you trade monthly and your P&L is the judge of what you take home to feed your family, right. I am not an advocate of taking stocks into earnings. Take options into binary events because risk is defined. Yes. So whatever you, you, you know, put up on the line, you could lose. It's not endless. 
Okay, or you wait for the print, you, you wait for the after hours trading. And yes, it is the Wild West after hours, but if you're prepared with your levels and you know what the market's looking for and you see the reaction, you can, you can get involved afterwards. Once there's a little bit of price discovery after hours, it's just a lot quicker. Yeah, no, that that's good, and and I and and you said a, a number of really interesting things here too, about you have to determine what type of trader you are, right? Or because that in the end is a strategy you're going to use, and also you have to adapt that strategy to your own personality too. <laughs> so let's walk through how you, your process, right? Where uh, how you got started in this, and how you've evolved over the years. <laughs> okay, yeah, how much time do we have? <laughs> days or, or half an hour? Or so, <laughs> um, so I started in uh, like 1998. Okay, um, I started at a place called Daytech, which was Broadway Trading. That was when we were like Nasdaq 3000 on the ramp up to Nasdaq 5000, where people left being a doctor, they left being a lawyer, they thought they can get rich quick, fast, becoming an active trader. Yep. So, and a lot of them did. Some of them did, and then they, they lost it just as you know as fast as they made it. Yep. So. Um, I wound up working with a group under a, a gentleman or a good friend of mine called Mark Sperling, and there was like 400 traders there, and I, I really learned the price action and feel of the market, um, and I you know, rode the market up from 3,000 to 5,000. That's when things were nuts. You would get right. a dot com on a, the end of a company and things would go 100 points. Yep. You know, we were actually very long-minded, not very short-minded. Um, and then, you know, I watched the tech bubble burst and <laughs> unfortunately I wasn't a good short, but I was very good at catching those little small bounces <laughs> Yeah. Um, and didn't get ran over. But, you know, that actually helped with my experience. And by the way, everyone moving behind me is we're in the T3 live room. So those are the trading counselors and whatnot. It's the end of the day. That's awesome. <laughs> um, they're very nice, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, so that was like my first real experience in the market where I where I could say anything could happen. I right. learned that any stocks could go as high as they want to go. Yes. I was sitting at my desk when Qualcomm announced their, I think, four for one stocks, but it went up a few hundred points. I was like, after a Thursday night out, I remember it was like 8.15 in the morning on a Friday. I saw the news and I was like, boom, boom, boom. I bought it and went up X amount of points. Yeah. <laughs> but then I also watched stocks go get cut in half or, get, you know, go down 90 percent of what they were worth. You know, so I learned that you don't catch a falling knife Rust. on your stops. Rust. So, um, you know, to try and move it along, then by the time it was 2002 or three, our 400 traders went down to about 30 wow. because it yeah. got hard yes. and nobody wanted to put the time in and the work and get the education. Right. And that's actually when I started reading Investor's Business Daily. Um, I love the, your, the newspaper and uh, not because I'm doing this with you. I, you know, intrinsically started reading it and I started telling traders, listen, if you're, you know, an active trader that uses technical analysis this is the newspaper for you and i love the 10 secrets to success um and i actually put it on twitter all the time yep and then um you know and then slowly we educated ourselves i read how to make money in stocks i took a few technical analysis courses so i was i, I really honed in on what i was doing by using the force yes. <laughs> by, or feel what we would call traders have a feel and then i started using you know putting definitions to actually um the process and, then and I, and so in 2003, right, because uh, we about started around the same time, so it's really, really interesting to hear this. Yeah, I, and I learned during the – where I really learned this was during the bear market, you know, 2000, 2002. I had no idea that we were in this bear market. I just learned how to sell very quickly. <laughs> and, and then 2003, you know, this was, you know, the, the really the, the, the next bull market that started – that's where we invaded Iraq, I exactly, remember. yes, which was such a great lesson right there because the market is going to a lot of times do the complete opposite of what you're thinking, right? And, yes. and, and how scary was that back in 2003 when we went into Iraq? Uh, but that was also the beginning of the next bull market. I remember when Art Cashin, who I love, he's a cocktail napkin technician, that's why I kind of yes. emulate. He said, you know, you buy the room, you know, you sell the room, or you buy the bombs. Yes. You know, and when not, and the bomb started falling, and that was the start of the run from 2000, 2003 all the way up to, you know, 2007 ish. Yes. You know, which was a really steady, nice bull run. Yep. And now talk um, about 2008, because the, now, <laughs> once again, here was another huge test, another once in a lifetime event occurred within a, in a decade, right? Yeah, that was like the perfect storm that, you know, you had inflated, inflated housing because people were owning five homes, putting zero money down. And then the banks were patching and packaging. I can get through the whole thing. But anyway, yeah. 
So the reason why I became a media guy, just so you know, back in the day, I was also an MC on bar mitzvahs and weddings in high school and college. That's how I paid for it. But That's awesome. you know, I became a trader and I was always a finance guy. I was a finance marketing major in college and I paid my way through school by doing that. So anyway, very cool. Um, I was on, uh, you know, I got invited on CNBC because I had a group and guys knew me and like, oh, let's, you know, there were no more specialists on the floor anymore. That's when they were leaving. And Bob Pisani is like, oh, let's hear from a trader. Let's bring them onto the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So I went on with Aaron Burnett, Mark Keynes, and Bob Pisani. And Mark Keynes, who used to beat up everybody, I was like this kid, you know, clean shaven. And, you know, how long ago was that? It was 13 years ago. My goodness. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Right there, we had a head and shoulders top pattern in the S&P and the Dow, mm-hmm. and the things felt faulty. And he's like, so, Scott, what's going to happen here in the market? I'm like, well, looks like we're about to break whatever it was. It was like 12,300 in the Dow. I'm like, we're going to fall about at least 10, 15 percent. And he and, that, and obviously, we just had a bull market since 2003. He's like, yeah. what are you talking about? Yeah. I'm, I'm like, we're going to go to 11 to 6 on the Dow. He's like, no way. I'm like, yeah, way. And then we're going to probably bounce and then roll over, and we could probably see a, a lot lower. So, P.S., a week or two later, we were at 11.6. They had me back on. And then I was on probably once a week during the entire financial crisis. And, um, you know, it, and it, was, you know, it was great. I got, you know, not just no. not besides my mom loving it, me on TV, <laughs> watching it from Florida. <laughs> I got to help a lot of traders because at that point we didn't have Twitter, really. We didn't have um, as many ways to communicate with the trading public. So people would wait and watch. And, and I was pretty good where I, I was like, stay away, stay away, stay away. Yeah. You know, all the way down until we broke below 9,500 in the Dow. And I think I came out to buy in three tiers, maybe three days before Buffett came out and said, you know, I'm buying stocks, which was pretty cool because I showed my little tiny headline versus his huge (laughs) one. And I think he did a little bit better than I did. (laughs) But that was like my whole, you know, jumping in with both hands into the media world. And then I've really, I've actually been on once a week pretty much ever since. And I've been on Fox Business now for the past three years, every Monday, I like five after three for a trader hit. So you know, and I, I don't buy media time. We don't have a publicist or, or a booker. I, they just call because they're on my note and they realize that I'll, I'll tell it like it is. And, yep. you know, I'll be a bull or bear based on the market, not for what they need that day in order to uh, take one side of the market like they do sometimes. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that's beautiful. Uh, so the markets continue to hang in there and a number of leading stocks continue to move higher even after the, the, the couple days sell off that we've had earlier this week. Now, remember, once again, we've started earnings season. And so make sure you know when your stocks are reporting. Let's take a quick break. But when we return, we are going to talk with Scott about how he uses moving averages to get an edge in the market. Stay tuned. Want to find stocks like the ones on this podcast? A lot of the best names we talk about come from IBD's exclusive stock lists, like the IBD 50 and the Big Cap 20. Whatever type of investor you are, we got a list for you. You can access every one of IBD's lists, plus stock ratings, exclusive analysis, and one-on-one coaching with a membership to IBD Digital. It costs less than a dollar a day, but for podcast listeners, we're offering an even better price. Go to investors.com slash podcast offer right now and get your first two months for only $20. Scott Redler is our guest on investing with IBD. Okay, Scott, let's get into how you use moving averages in your trading strategy. And the first question, I guess, is uh, what are the, the specific moving averages that you use? Since I'm a prop trader and I try and trade for momentum, and mm-hmm. since I'm at my seat and I can always make adjustments fast, I try and live uh, above the 8 and 21 day moving average. Okay. So to me, what I call the 8 and 21 day moving average, it's like my lifeline to the active trend. So when the market is above the 8 and 21 day moving average, or if a, a momentum name that's on my go to list is above it, I try and be long. Because typically that means we're in a strong market, there's momentum, you know, you, you're having a move above a, a solid pattern, it's creating a bull flag, it's continuing. So I tend to use a tier system to be in some kind of what I call a portfolio approach, meaning I want to be long the best names for that active sequence above the 8 and 21 day moving average because the market's strong. So besides trading and actively adding cash flow around my positions, mm-hmm. I want to let the market make me some money as it's trending. Okay, so you'll have a core position that you hold as the the eight and the twenty one day continue to move up as they're above the they find support right at forty five degrees sixty degree, <laughs> uh, but now but but uh, 
Now, when they start breaking it, that's when you're lighting up. Or while while they're trending above the eight in twenty one day, uh, uh, there, there's a point where you may lighten a little bit off the positions, though, right? But you'll still keep your core position. Yes, I, I, I'm very I'm a proponent of tier system where it's not all or nothing. Yes. You have a core position, all of a sudden it breaks out above a great base or an awesome chart pattern. You add to it, it gets in motion, it makes a move, you sell some into strength and hold some and trail it and continue to stay with the trade as long as the trade stays strong. Yep. So if the trade changes, then I change my position on whatever I'm looking at and, and I adjust. But as long as it's above the 821 day, to me, that's a very strong name, and it's something I'd rather be long than short. Yeah. And and so let, let's go back to uh, one concept that you mentioned right here, and this is the all-or-nothing concept. Because especially for those who are new, and this is what I did when I was new, it was all-or-nothing. You know, <laughs> I would just sell all my shares at, at, or buy all my shares at one time, right? But over the years, I've learned that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It'd be a partial buying, partial selling, or a tiered approach, as you said. A hundred percent. I'll sometimes do an all out if I break a stop. True. Okay, if the True. trade goes awry. Okay. But typically when I'm in the trade, I use what I call a tier system. And I, I, talk, I call it a tier system because every trade is different. You know, there are guys that subscribe to T3 Live, you know, or Red Laurel Access that have a hundred thousand dollar trading account. There are guys that have a million. There are guys that read my note that have a billion dollar hedge fund. Mm -hmm. So the tier system is different for everyone. It's basically your conviction level. So typically when a stock's in a base and it looks ready to go, I'll be in like a tier one. So I actively engage it. Okay. So whatever I kind of want to be in that you know, that as if, if it's not in motion yet, it's not driving me nuts yeah. that if it's not going. Yeah. So, but typically, if all of a sudden it shows relative strength, it breaks above uh, a level or above a chart pivot that I'm looking at, then I'll add to like a tier two, okay. which I'll, means additional shares because it's ready to go because, you know, now I have more, so I'm a little less comfortable, but it's going to be in motion. So, you know, the trade is there, so I want to maximize it. And the only time I'll really be in T3, if it's like one of my favorite names, you have total time continuity, the the daily, the 15, the five, the monthly, and it's just like a major level. Then maybe I'll get in tier three because typically when I'm in tier three, which is the most amount of shares, you know, your hair is tingling on the back of your neck. <laughs> if you're wrong, you lose more than you probably would normally lose in, in a situation that you're going with. Yeah. So, you know, so then all of a sudden if it does what you think it's going to do and breaks out, you know, you let it go. And then when it gets to one of your projections, you get down to tier two. You know, then it goes to another one, you get back to tier one, then it pulls back into here, maybe you get back to tier two, it goes back, you get to tier one, it continues to go, and then all of a sudden you held for a bunch of days and, you know, you traded around your position feeling good by netting money, yeah. but you also let the market and the stock make you money versus, you know, running for the exit uh, just because you, you see a green screen or you're counting the cash. Yeah, and, and, and that's another really important concept here because – your approach, just like even IBD's approach, it's very rules-based, mechanical, and that helps you manage those emotions. Talk a little bit about, especially for newer traders, the emotions that they can face and how they can lead you in the wrong direction. Yeah, you have to, what I say, you can't let your highs get too high. You can't let your lows get too low. Um, you know, you try and want to be prepared with the routine so you can take the emotions out of the trade. You know, we've all gotten hit in the morning where you take out a strong stock, you think you're going to get followed through the next day, and all of a sudden something happens in the macroeconomic world where it's lower, and you're like, oh, my God, I just got you know um, sandbagged. So yes. you have to figure out you know, where is my stop, how am I going to manage it, how am I going to be calm, cool, and collective, and you know, salvage the trade or maybe even make more from the trade because sometimes it opens lower, it holds your level, you could add to it, it goes green, pushes up, you make money on the – you know, volatility, and then you're still in the trade for the reason you were in it. Yep. Um, but really, the, the way you slow down the emotions in the trade is by being prepared. Like, did you ever see, um, that one time I was actually listening to a, an interview by Brett Favre. Nice. And uh, are you are you a football fan? Oh, yes, yeah, so I'm a huge football fan. <laughs> so he was talking about when he was like, a, you know, a rookie quarterback. You know, you get the playbook. And you get on the field, yeah. and everything is like blurry. You know, the receiver's going that way, the tight end's going this way. You can't read the defenses, and you're new. Yes. So everything just yes. looks so damn fast. Yep. And then, 
you learn the playbook and you start seeing some defenses and then all of a sudden he's like, oh, then I start to see the field. Yep. Things slow down. Right. I could see the receiver running the route. I, I can hand the ball off. I know when they're ready to blitz. I know when they're, you know, doing cover two. And and then I could execute because I have experience. Yep. So it's really experience and a routine and a process and knowing your levels, which takes the emotion out of the trade and makes it a bit more mechanical. Yeah, and and things slow down at that, especially if you go through a 2000 or a 2008, you've seen the worst that uh, the the market can bring you. <laughs> uh but and and then things you know you, things slow down, you know the risk cuz you've learned the hard way. And and especially yes. for new 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 traders, you have to put your hand on the stove too, you know, to realize, you know, I had to ride a stock down like 80% to learn, oh, maybe I should cut my losses quickly. You know, I, right. I, when I had they to... break the A in 21 day, you should have been out. Exactly. Or maybe the 50 day. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but things do slow down uh, with that experience. Uh, so now let's get into another concept. We'll definitely go over more examples of the A in 21 day in, in segment three. Um, but let's get into I think another the, another important part of being a trader, being an investor, and, and that's work life balance. Go over your routines and and how uh, you manage this. Well, I'm up every day at four forty five in the morning, so that's an early wake up. Yes. Um, right away, I'm looking overseas to see what's going on in Europe and Asia to see what they did, so I can kind of vision in my head where our future should be. I start tweeting about it just to give a basic view of the day. And then, you know, I'm in my office by 6.30. I'm the first one that turns on the lights. I start writing my note for Rather All Access because I like it to be as real-time and transparent as possible in the morning. Um, by 7.30, it's at the editor. I go in. I start doing my video. Some guys like to read. Some guys like to see a video. So, so I have a bit of both. Mm -hmm. That's till 8.30. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm done with the video. We send it out to our subscribers. And 8.45, I start, you know, putting together 15 different charts that I spoke about in my note and in the video, and I post it. So that's another thing. By 9.15, I'm now on you know, at my desk. I'm ready to trade. I put my headphone on, and I talk to um, Keith, you know, the virtual trading floor about what's happening as I'm trading. Yep. You know, and then by 11.30, um, everything slows down. Uh, at that point, you know, I've been up since 4.45, so it's almost like a whole day for some people. Right. And, uh, and what I do is I go to the gym. I put my stops in. And people are like, oh, my God, Red Dog, how do you leave your desk? I'm like, well, I put stops in where my swing trade changes, not where, you know, the amount of money I want to lose. That's a sizing issue. And then I go to the gym and, you know, I go, I take a swim, spin class, a Stairmaster. I do whatever I need to do to burn it off. Yep. And then um, come back at 2 o'clock, trade the close, do my recap. And you know, really what I do for the balance on the weekends is I coach youth sports. You know, I'm, awesome. I'm, I'm, I've been coaching my son uh, in lacrosse in second grade, and we are 44 and 0, and he's in fifth grade now. Wow! But it's not <laughs> all about winning. But <laughs> winning, winning is fun. Um, you know, I've done two uh, Ironman uh, races, which, if you don't know, that's a, the biggest triathlon out there. So I've also been running with my son since he's one. That's amazing. Um, the reason why I do that is because um, my best friend died of leukemia when he was 30. Wow! So when I was 30, I started to raise money with triathlons, and I started. Um, with a sprint and then I did an Olympic and then, you know, three years later I raised almost 50 grand for, uh, the Ironman in Lake Placid because wow. at that point it was 2008 and no one was really doing it. And that's, that's really when I got serious about trading was when my friend passed away and, you know, and all of a sudden we, you, you think that, you know, life is short and, Seriously. you know, just grow up. You know, right. that was when I grew up. Um, and I was, I think I was just about 30 and that's when I started doing the racing. So, for me, racing has been a way to blow off steam, clear my head, think about the day. You know, if you had a bad day at work, it's not it doesn't mean you're a bad person. If you had a red P and L day, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. So you have to do things that clear the head. And on the weekends, I'm always like, feed the brain, do whatever it takes to feed your brain, so you get rid of the week, so you can come back mentally strong, so then you could execute execute the following week. Yep. For me, I train with a bunch of guys. We do Ragnar races now. Um, I, like I said, I, I coach lacrosse. Um, also basketball and I've done, you know, all that kind of stuff. And if you're not that athletic, it's okay too. You could play chess, if, you know, hang out with your dog at the doggy park, something that gets you outside. I have a right. dog too. I love my dog. Yeah, me too. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, something to get yourself away from the market that, that relieves your stress and, and puts a, you know, a better feeling in your brain. So this way, you know, you, you leave the day behind you. And then you look forward to the day ahead. But you remember what you did wrong the day behind you. And sometimes keeping um, a journal will help you yep. um, talk to yourself to create your inner voice. So maybe you 
make less mistakes or you don't do at least the same mistakes if you write it down because when you're about to do the same mistake, maybe that inner voice will say, hey, Red Dog, you did that last week and you shouldn't be doing that again because yep. you wrote it down. Yep. No, that, yeah, a post analysis, uh, writing rules to adapt to your personality is very, very important. And sometimes you may have to break those rules a few times and, and then find, let me write a rule for this. And then it may take you a few more times to actually follow those rules. Yes. And the sooner the better. <laughs> yeah. So always make sure you are looking at moving averages when you're analyzing your stocks. They're going to give you insight on how the trend is going with that stock and whether that stock trend is changing. Okay, coming up next, we are going to discuss a few stocks that are worth considering for your watch list and a few stocks that where these moving averages really helped you out. We'll be back. Hey, Arusha here with a big announcement. We have launched a brand new interactive video broadcast called IBD Live. IBD Live takes you behind the curtain to see how professionals trade. Log on and watch live as IBD's analysts and portfolio managers follow the first hour of market action and pick winning stocks. You get to listen to our conversations, see our screens, and ask us questions all in real time. If you've ever wanted to trade alongside a team of experts, this is your chance. Go to investors.com slash IBD live and sign up to get your first two weeks for free. We are back with Scott Redler on investing with IBD. Okay, Scott, let's get into three current stocks here. And the first one is the one that's on top of most people's mind. That's Tesla. And uh, so, we're, we're gonna you we're, these are gonna be examples for the eight and twenty one day and and let me just mention Scott Redler and the T three organization they just released uh, an ebook that's free right that for everyone yes. out there and he tweeted it out I think maybe a few days ago or last week uh, it's called the ultimate guide to moving averages and so we're gonna be referring to this also and it has Tesla in here and and uh, the other stocks too so let's go into Tesla. And walk us through uh, this trade and how the 8 and 21 day moving averages helped you here. Well, first time again, like I told you, since 1998, I've been trading. So some, sometimes you have a little intuition. Yes. You never put a lot of money behind intuition. Last quarter, when Tesla was trading, I think, what was it? It was, it was like a 270. Um, everyone was really negative, And I looked at the base. It was a huge base, mm -hmm. you know, of where no one's made money for two years between 200 and 380, the or 384, what 386 was the all time high. I'm like, you know what, I'm going to take I don't take stock into earnings. I'm like, let me just take some options. So I think I did a call spread, which I call a lotto spread, which was a lot higher, where I'm like, let me risk X and I can make six, seven, eight, nine times, you know, if I'm right. Right. So, and you never want to put too much behind in the PS boom last quarter was like their monumental quarter and it was fantastic. A lot of my subs made really good money in the options because everyone could see my option call spread because I'm transparent with all that I do. And that was like, <laughs> wow, that was fantastic. That was fun. But now let's play ball. So if you, you know, if you download, which I'll post a link on Twitter to my ebook page 13, um, you could actually see here, you know, you could see here that was the gap up. So, so um, they reported move, earnings. They reported earnings on October twenty third, and, and they and they had a huge gap up, seventeen percent yes. the next day, right? Uh, and and so yeah, so that's where the trends already change, right? Yes, and just so write this down too. That's a what I call a pro earnings gap. Those okay. could be the most profitable to identify because if you have a pro earnings gap, you could actually even buy the stock that day mm -hmm. and put the the low of that candlestick as your stop because if it doesn't fill that gap that means power yep that's a pro earnings gap so you could have not been in and not had the options and it wasn't too late yes so if you look right here at the chart again like um that you have up you could have bought it then and then you had a quick move up okay which was you know very fast and furious yep. and then on this little pullback here um which is you know, around it, october it, 31st or so at the end right. of October. It, that, you don't have it there, but it actually came right to the eight day moving average. Okay. And that was your buy. So once it came in and held the eight day moving average, that's when I got back involved in the stock. So okay. the, earn, the options plays behind. That's yeah. when I'm buying the stock. Okay. Okay. And right there, I actually went out and said, hey, I think that this is going to make an all time high. I went out and bought a call spread. I bought the 380 calls and I sold the 420s. Okay. So I'm like, just in case it doesn't trade well, because Tesla's kind of crazy, yeah. at least my thesis is it's going to make an all time high. Yep. So 
you know, I started to be in the name and I'm in the options now. So you had the first move up. And then I remember that Thursday into Friday, I was still long the stock on my options. And all of a sudden they released a cyber truck. I actually was a little too boisterous for myself because I was yeah. making such good money. Yeah. As they say, don't let your highs get too high. And then the truck came out, they broke the window, the stock was down $20 <laughs> and everyone was bashing me all over right. Twitter because three days before that, I, I came up with like a little teaser saying I have the next stock that can make you 150 points. Because I thought it can get above 380, that's 150 points, 420 yeah. was the first target, whatever. So that's when the gap down happened. <laughs> and then um, if you look there, though, if you, on page 13, you'll see it consolidated. And then finally, once it went back above, like 351, it was back above the 8 and 21 day. At that point, I didn't care yeah. what people in the media were saying. Now it's strong again. Yep. I got back in the stock. I actually bought another call spread because I wanted more exposure. And then, P.S., it's been above the 8 and 21 day this entire run from right. 350 all the way to pre-earnings now. So if you don't short a stock that's above the A in 21 day, you did not take pain like these funds that have been blowing up and going out of business. If you bought it every time it touched the eighth day, you made a lot of money besides playing breakouts. Yeah, yeah. And and this is a great lesson on, you know, don't short the strongest stock in the market. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, and, and, very and, good lesson. Right, you, and, you ride and, those because it doesn't happen often, and this is a historic move, and it made a lot of traders a lot of money. Exactly, and uh, and 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 this is also another good example of don't let your emotions or just your biases lead your because people just were just betting on that Tesla was going to go to zero, that Elon Musk was just spending money left and right, uh, and and they got run over. Uh, the other thing is, I think the final thing is. Don't bet against the entrepreneur, like a a, a <laughs> super a visionary who who's done yes. it in the past. I, uh, can I say another yeah. uh, real quick thesis? There, there were two or three times when Tesla was like, you know, fifty points above the eight day. Okay, which is another way to use it. And I'm like, guys. Do not be chasing it because everyone's all excited Good up point. here, yep. you know, unless you're going to be able to hold a 40, 50 point move lower. And all three times <laughs> they wound up pulling back 40, 50 points. So if you were an active trader and you chased it and you bought it there, chances are you might have been stopped out before the buy at the eight day pull in before it went again. Yep. So there are ways to buy on the eight day and there are ways to say, hey, you know what? I missed it. It's way too extended from the eight day because an eight day stock riding it is strong, let alone 80 points above the eight day. You know, you just know that, you know, you're a day away from some kind of pullback that you right. might not be able to handle if you have too many shares and you don't have the risk. Definitely. The enthusiasm can also if you get if you start getting too excited about this and you kind of mentioned this before or the way I look at it is if I start thinking I'm getting good. Uh, uh, investing in the markets, it's like I better lighten up, right? You, you better. Well, that's what I did into the, the binary event with the cyber truck. I was like, okay, this is gonna be great. Yeah. You know, meanwhile, it was a binary event. I should have just had options, not the stock, because that day hurt. Yes, yes, and and also, uh, it looks like Tesla right now. They reported earnings after the hours. They're up eleven percent. Uh, sure. Currently trading at six forty seven right now, or six forty eight. Um, so, okay, let's go to the second stock. And before the we go on, can oh, I yeah. talk about two real quick tactics? Sure. So before earnings, listen, it's very risky to trade stocks after earnings. But if you identify the earnings pivot, okay, meaning what was the, the, the previous high? The previous high for Tesla was 594.50. Okay. So in order to get to 640, what do you have to get through first after hours? Get 594.50. Right. That was all those pivot. numbers. Yep. So I said, if you don't have to take it into the earnings, wait for the earnings, wait for the action. Once it cleared 594.50, if you trade after hours, yeah. there was a trade there. And I did trade it after hours. I only made, you know, up until the 620 area, but I had to come here and I didn't want to hold it. <laughs> but I also took options just to be involved. Yes. So not only could I trade it after hours using that 594 pivot, I also was able to you know, to have the options just in case where my risk was defined. But knowing that op that earnings pivot, you can trade after hours with the plan versus just throwing things against the wall like the Wild West. Right. You know, there is a plan and a way to do it. And, and that, that's the name of the game right there. You have to have a plan. Let's go to the second stock, and this is Beyond Meat and, and another controversial stock out there that went on a monster run uh, early last year or, or mid last year and, and came back in. Everyone uh, gave up on it, but it started coming up on your radar, right, Scott? Yes, it did. So if you remember when Beyond Meat came out in the beginning of its infancy, you know, in the you could see the first month or two or three of the chart, yes. it was above the 8 and 21 day moving average. Yep. What does that mean? That means it's strong. That means that momentum is pent up. That means shorts are trapped. So the move from, you know, 
80 or 60 all the way up to the peak where you had a breakout failure above that 200 right there. I don't know if you see my, what I'm drawing with that little um, – No, I, you know, I don't see anything. <laughs> you can't see the arrow there? <laughs> no. So anyway, no. Um, the first – Six months, it was above the A and 21 day, and it was a momentum trade, and you could make really good money, right. even though it was risky. Yep. Then you fast forward to, um, I believe, where was it over the, the summer when they came out to McDonald's news, and it gapped up to like 148 and got and failed at the A and 21 day. Then all of a sudden, it was glass half full, and it rode the A and 21 day down underneath it, not above it. Right. From 80 to 240, it was above it. Right. From 140 down to 75, it was below it. Yep. You could have said, hey. You know, momentum's gone, I'm out. And then, you know, in the in the end of December, when I put out my 2020 report, I started looking at some of the IPOs from last year that might have been having tax loss selling that, you know, could, you know, have the January effect that went from 240 down to 75. I'm like, okay, now it's getting tight again. I started buying a little bit like a tier one, like we talked about the tier system. Yeah. And then if you look a little bit closer to the end of December, all of a sudden, boom. It cleared the A in 21 day right around 77.50 with an igniting bar. What do we do with an igniting bar? We don't short it. We get long it because sometimes it ignites a move. That's why we call it an igniting bar. Okay. And the target was 100 to 120, and it actually went to 135. So during this you know, basing process in November and December, finally got back above the A in 21 day, showing that now momentum can come back. And then you had an igniting bar in volume, and boom, PS tax loss selling was done, yeah. and you could have made 25%. In, in, in a week or so, and we did that. I did that, you know, yeah. and p- people could see it. So anyway, um, at this point, it's consolidating. It hit 135 today. I think it hit 114. There was news that something with Canada and, you know, they, they weren't using their products and something. But either which way, I feel like the 21 day is right around 106. So I will see in the next day or so if if it's viable around 106. But Again, above the A and 21 day when momentum was there and shorts were trapped and was trading with patterns and you could use the tier system beyond was awesome. Yep. And then all of a sudden when the juice is loose and it broke, yep. you get away from it and then you could revisit it once it's consolidated and you have you know a, a whole new life there. And now we'll see if it could prove to hold that 106 as we head into earnings in two weeks. Yeah, and, and so really the, the key here was uh, on, on January 7th, once it really powered through the 8 and the 21 day, that's when, the, okay, now that was it at really has and a half to eighty one. It was also above that that lower consolidation. Yes, exactly. So you had it on a price consolidation and on a moving average basis, letting you know that the character of the stock was changing. So that in in Scott's ebook is on page twelve. So definitely refer to that. Let's go to the. By the way, what you said right there is very important. Character. Yes. Okay. Character of the market and of the stock, and the way you judge the character is whether or not it's above the 8 and 21 day. Is it a strong character? Is it losing momentum? Is it feeling sick? Is it sickly? Yep. Moving averages can tell you that. Perfect, perfect. Okay, let's go to the third stock. That's Apple, another one that's done very, very well over the last four or five months. Uh, and uh, Four or five years. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Really, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who's counting? <laughs> but, it, you know, Apple over the last quarter or so has been trading like it's 2004 again, right? It, and uh, yeah. and uh, but and its character changed. Once it was basing, like, like, and that's a common theme that, that throughout this episode, it was basing, and a lot of people probably didn't assume that as like, how much f- how much further could Apple go? But your moving averages started to give you more insight and say, hey, you know what? The character's starting to change. The momentum's coming back in. And, you know, I, I did actually a live video the day after last quarter's earnings. So if you look at the, you know, you point that out on the chart, mm-hmm. um, it was right around 247. Okay, so there was a low of 245. There was a high of 250 right around last quarter's earnings. And I did a video. Okay. I'm like, listen, earnings are out. Um, it's now above the 8 21 day. You could buy it verse 245. You could point that out on the chart for them. And, and then add to it when it gets above 250 for new highs. P.S., that was a fantastic trade. By that next Monday, it was like a 260. So it was a great, you know, com- you know, just packed, impacted trade that took off. And then it's been above the 8 and 21 day pretty much since, besides maybe two sessions or three sessions during the entire rally from October till today. Right. And, 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 now, and there, there were a couple of – well, it looks like there was one time where on December 3rd it came back – and was below the 21-day for for that one day 
Now, at that point, are you lightening up at that, or are you giving it another yeah, yeah. day? You can you can get out. You okay. can get out and revisit when it gets back above it after okay. price discovery. I do remember that. I think that was around. Um, where was that? That that was uh, that was on December third, right two fifty six. It made a low of two fifty six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. Okay, you know what? I do remember that. It came below two sixty, went to two fifty six. I definitely was out of it, and then I don't think I got back into it until like a week later after it popped back up, consolidated, uh-huh. and then took out that little spot. So probably um, around like December twelfth or December thirteenth, around that. That's when you're like, okay. It, 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 that's when it proved it right. could rebuild. I call that like rebuilding. Yeah. Once you break the in twenty one day and you get out of the way, traders like, all right, good. I don't care if it falls apart. It's done. <laughs> the worst thing is when you get out of it and then it only goes down for a day or two, then gets back above and goes and you're out of it. You're like, oh, I can't get, believe I get out of it. But you know what? The time you get out of it when it breaks it and then falls 40 points, you're a lot happier than the time you get out of it. It regroups after three days and you have to pay up a little bit more for it. Right. But at least the, the stock in the market proved it's worthy of your risk. Yes. And and I think another key thing that you're showing here is being being flexible, having an open mind. Right. If it just because you get out of a stock doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go down. Right. And if it goes against what your initial thinking was, you got to adjust. You got to be flexible and get back in it. Uh, once it starts proving itself again. Yes, and you know what? It doesn't remember. The stock doesn't yes, know if you yes. sold it or you bought it. That's perfect. A lot of people are like, oh, it knows. Yes. <laughs> the stock doesn't know exactly. if you got out wrong or you bought wrong, or if you had too many shares or you didn't honor your stock. Yep, <laughs> exactly. The, the, the market or the stock doesn't care what's happened to you before. <laughs> Uh, let's or go. We tried it a few days before. <laughs> right, exactly. Let's go very, very quickly over one last stock, and that's Microsoft. Uh, yeah, w- walk us through this one. Microsoft was, you know, same type of situation. Right around when when uh, Apple broke out, I remember there was like a, a, a channel. There was like a, a four month channel. Yep, and um, around October twenty eighth, uh, it broke out of the consolidation. There, uh, it's a it's a flat base on Market Smith. Yes, exactly. I, and I looked at that on Market Smith. You could have bought it the day after earnings the same way with Apple. If you look mm-hmm. at the chart, you go back to um, wh- where was that? That was uh, uh, October twenty fourth. It looks like around there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this day right here. Okay, there was um, it came out with earnings. I remember. Yeah. And then you could have bought the day after earnings it, and it said, "I'm going to give it to the the post earnings low because yep. there was another pro earnings gap." Yep. And then I remember I bought it there. I think it was like a Wednesday or a Thursday, or no, earnings were Thursday. I bought it Thursday, added to it Friday, and then I actually I got l- kind of lucky because they they won the Jedi contract. I remember That's I was out right. to dinner with a bunch That's of couples. Right. Yep. I got a phone call, Red Dog. Did you see Microsoft's up five dollars? I'm like, really? They're like they won the uh, versus Amazon. Right. So you know, got a, got a little lucky, but I was in the right trade. So you know, what's luck when opportunity meets preparation? If you're in the right trade, sometimes exactly. you get a little lady luck. Yep. So that was nice. Sold some, and then it consolidated again. You know, and then I remember saying to people on Twitter, I'm like, you could buy it versus the, the, you know, the gap of that Jedi contract and never went below. And then it went again. And then literally just like Apple, it was above the A21 day pretty much the entire time, except for like two or three occasions where you could have got out and then waited a little bit and then wrote it again. Yeah, no, perfect. And another great example to go back and, and study. Uh, so there are a few stocks that you, you want to consider for your walk. Just and go back and study and definitely download the, the free ebook by Scott Redler, The Ultimate Guide to Moving Averages. Scott will, I'm sure, tweet it out again on, on, on Twitter. I'll retweet it. So you guys definitely you. want to check that out. Uh, so thanks, Scott, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. I had a lot of fun. That's it for this week on Investing with IBD. Next week, we are going to have J.C. Peretz, founder of All Star Charts, on the podcast. I'm Arusha Pierce, and thanks for listening. <laughs>